here we have so far some receptors phagocytic receptors see how you're going to keep this in your brain chemotactic receptors there's going to be two more classes all right that's all we have time for today i know it's sad and we're going to cry but we have an experiment to do today so let's do 10 minutes so that would be 10 after and you have your butts back in seats yay look ahead at the other receptors so it's not brand new on monday We have lots more pattern recognition receptors. Perhaps my favorite class of pattern recognition receptors are the toll-like receptors. What the hell kind of name is toll? And like, okay, the best part is they're not even toll receptors, they're toll-like receptors. Well, toll, all right, the people who originally found this, they were German and they said, das ist der Toll, which means <laughs> this is totally cool. Literally, that's what, I mean, that's how stupid we are, okay? And then they named these receptors toll-like receptors. They had no interest in what we now know is important for toll-like receptors with respect to immunology. They were looking at um, early developmental markers and looking at dorsal ventral patterning. And so I have a fish here. Does anybody know what this is? It's a hammerhead shark, right? How do you know dorsal and ventral? Everybody knows the dorsal fin is the come, you know, the thing that comes at you out of the water, right? Under the water, if you do this, it looks like you're a no, shark. <laughs> well, so what they were doing was they were looking at this dorsal ventral patterning in I don't know what organism, and they found that if they mutated some of these toll receptors, it messed up the dorsal ventral patterning, meaning that you could have ended up with two dorsal sides, right? Nobody thinks two dorsal sides good, right? Who wants two dorsal sides versus two ventral sides? Since that time, now we now know that these toll light receptors are not just important for development, but they're also very important for ancient defense systems, part of your innate immune system. This is what happened when they knocked out a uh, toll gene in flies. So this was done in 1996. And I hope you can recognize, as far as your science goes, when you guys learn about stuff, mostly the stuff that you learn in our classes is from the 50s, the 40s, the 30s, the 20s, shit that's from a long time ago. This is relatively a huge development not that long ago. It might seem like long ago to you guys, right? It's close to 2000. So in my lifetime, I learned all about immunology, and then new things happened. So this is one of the new things. They knocked out this particular gene, and all of this stuff that you see here is a fungus. And it's growing on the fruit fly because it doesn't have the toll gene anymore. And this led them to believe that not only was it important for this dorsal ventral patterning, but it's also important for just protection against uh, invaders such as fungus and other things. So that fruit fly is not gonna live. That's a sad little fruit fly. I don't know about you guys, but fruit flies are cute, yes? Right up until the point you have 7,000 of them. There are a lot of these toll-like receptors. We're gonna only make you know these. So you do need to know all of these. It's not that many, all right? We call them TLRs, so you have TLR1, it forms a dimer with itself. You have TLR2, which functions as a dimer, but it has to have TLR6 with it. TLR3, TLR4, which is a dimer of itself. And this one also has to have an accessory molecule, CD14, which we're gonna talk about CD molecules in a minute. Five and nine. Right. And the idea is that these are going to recognize uh, PAMPs. And what was a PAMP? Pathogen Associated Molecular Patterns. And so I do want you to know what are the patterns that they recognize. All right. Okay, it makes it a little easier because right up at the top, right, you, one, two, and six are going to basically recognize peptidoglycan. 
Don't worry about all the rest of the shit, okay? Peptidoglycan. And we know that peptidoglycan is found in high abundance in gram positives on the outer surface, but it's also in gram negatives. Okay, TLR3 recognizes double strand RNA, and where did we find that? Viruses. TLR4 is really important for LPS, lipopolysaccharide, which is gram negatives. TLR5 is flagellin, right, and that's flagellin as opposed to what's in your flagella, microtubules, alpha and beta tubulin. And TLR9, these unmethylated CPG DNA motifs that we alluded to and said they happen. <laughs> okay, magic, it's magic they happen. And so originally it was thought that all of these TLRs were found on the cell surface of immune cells. We now know that this may not be actually the case. Some of these may be internal receptors that are found in endocytic compartments. What's an endocytic compartment? Any, anybody? No, no, not endothelial cells. This is endocytic compartments. Vesicles? Not vesicles. So what is the endocytic pathway, Chase? It leads up to the lysosome. It, lysosome. What's the first stop on the, pa on the pathway? Endosome. Early endosome. I heard somebody say early endosome, late endosome, lysosome. All right, so we now think that some of these receptors are found in the early endosomes or phagosome. They may end up in a phagosome. And this is talking, this picture is showing you what happens when we activate some of these TLRs. And the TLRs generally, okay, so TIR is a domain that's found in all of these toll-like receptors, and it stands for toll IL-1. So toll IL-1 receptor. So there's a domain that's found in the extracellular domain no, in the intracellular, I'm sorry, in the intracellular domain of this particular receptor. Okay, so we're talking about, whoopsie, how about we do that? So in the intracellular domain portion of the receptors, it has a tier domain. And the tier domain is what leads to the downstream signaling. So ligand binds, so in the case of TLR5, flagellin binds to the TLR5 receptor. That causes a change in conformation of the tier receptor. And then that tier receptor causes downstream signaling. Same thing with TLR3, except different, right? So you see these are the different ligands, different ligands for the different receptors. And what's nice about this is there's somewhat of a unity all of these can signal a molecule called NF kappa B. All right, so NF kappa B. All right, NF kappa B is a signaling molecule that is floating around in the cytosol of cells, and it's composed of two subunits, P65 and P50. So these are two subunits that are bound together. They're showing you right here, P65 and P50. And normally, so what do you think P65 stands for? What's P? It's a protein. So it's a protein of 65 uh, Daltons. I think those are kilodaltons. Kilodaltons. And so the other one, P50, is a protein that's 50 kilodaltons. We've named, now we're starting to name proteins based on size because we get tired of naming things. So it has two polypeptides that are bound to one another, and both of these are bound to a molecule called I kappa B. I kappa B is the inhibitor of kappa B. So it actually inhibits NF kappa B from functioning. Okay. It gets confusing. So NF kappa B is the combination. It's bound to this I kappa B and I kappa B inhibits NF kappa B from functioning. What is NF kappa B? Does anybody know? No? 
It is a transcription factor. What does a transcription factor do? Okay, it's in its name. It helps with, trans helps with transcription. It turns on transcription. It helps to start the machinery of transcription. So we're talking, uh, talking about turning on signals, right? Turning genes on and off to allow something to happen. All right, big picture, but go back to the big picture. Some bacteria or virus is recognized by a toll-like receptor. You want this cell to respond. Let's say this cell is a macrophage. What might you want it to do? Perform phagocytosis. What else? Secretes chemokines and cytokines. One more. It doesn't do opsonization. It only recognizes opsonized particles in phagocytosis. Then. And then what do we do after phagocytosis? We want to upregulate oxidative spe species so that we can do the killing. All right, so all of these receptors all right, will turn things on and off. So obviously what we need to do is we need for this transcription factor to go from being in the cytoplasm to being in the nucleus. How do things get transported into the nucleus? This is a 380 question. Mm. Ran. Ran. What does Ran recognize? Uh, <laughs> you're, you're doing good though, right? <laughs> so Ran is a small GTPase that facilitates the transport in and out of the nucleus. What do proteins have to have on them to get into the nucleus? A nuclear localization sequence, an NLS. So an NLS is a nuclear localization sequence. Sequence of what? Amino acids, thanks Haley. Okay, amino acids. What's generally in an NLS? Does anybody know what amino acids? If you were gonna guess a class of amino acids, what are the classes of amino acids? Oh, so you all did the brain dump? Blah! There went 380, gone. Okay, so generally nuclear localization sequences are positively charged amino acids. Which ones are those? Lysine. Arginine. So histidine is actually kind of a wussy positively charged amino acid because its pKa is 6.7, which is close to uh, neutral pH. The other two have a much high, uh, higher, lower, a bigger differential, <laughs> uh, pKa. So a lot of lysines and arginines. All right, well, so now I'm telling you for this P65, P50 complex to get into the nucleus, it has to have an NLS. Well, why does I kappa B inhibit this from getting to the nucleus? All right, if I have these two things bound to one another. And you put your hand on the bottom. Okay. Well, if the NLS is anywhere near where her hand is, what's going to happen? It can't be recognized. So the NF kappa B just blocks the NLS signal. When we take away I kappa B, ooh, look, now the NLS can go to the nucleus. That's all this is. This is a mechanism for keeping NF kappa B in the cytosol until signaling occurs. So what has to happen is these receptors do something. They bind the ligand, they get bound 
all right, something binds to their tier domain, that then causes I kappa B to be removed from NF kappa B. Okay, let's ask a, let's try another simple question. What's the easiest and probably fastest way to change the structure of a molecule? What can you do to it to make it change? What can you do to a protein? Phosphorylate it. All right, you're gonna see there's a ton of phosphorylation that happens. What's the enzyme that causes phosphorylation? A kinase. All right, so this whole thing right here, this is showing you what's happening to cause the phosphorylation of NF kappa B. IKK, okay, I, I don't think it can, right? IKK is a kinase that's gonna phosphorylate IKB. Okay, don't worry about all these intermediate ones. So IRAC, is part of this, I-R-A-T-A-K, trash 6 Eskit, Nick. don't worry about the middle ones. IKK gets activated when ligand binds to the receptor. IKK is going to phosphorylate I IKB. That causes a change in the conformation of IKB. It lets go of NF kappa B. Now NF kappa B can go to the nucleus. It's a little game. And so if you look at this picture, okay, let's just make it bigger. TLR1, TLR2, TLR6, right? TLR2 and 6 function together. TLR1 functions as a dimer. TLR5, we said, was going to recognize flagellin. TLR4, in combination with uh, CD14, is going to recognize LPS. Okay. You don't have to, don't worry about that for the moment. But what do you see in common with over here and here and here? What, what molecule? My D88. My D88. All right. My D88 is an adapter protein. And My D88 links to the. So My D88 links to, let's just, these little red, what are the little red things? The little red dots. The TIR domains. Sometimes it can link directly to the TIR domain, and sometimes it needs additional molecules. I can't make you remember all of these, right? So let's go with something binds, causes a change in conformation, which causes the recruitment of MIDE 88. Mighty 88 activates a kinase. Okay. Remember I just said Iraq? It, there's too many kinases. Okay. So this is a kinase complex. This is a kinase complex. These are the IKKs. Okay. I want you to remember Mighty 88 activates at least IKK. Right? It's just too many K's and, and K's. <laughs> There's a lot, a lot of K's. Mighty 88 goes to IKK. IKK is going to phosphorylate IKB. IKB comes off of the P50, P65, and of kappa B, and this can go into the nucleus. All of this to turn on or turn, turn off some molecules. Why is it so dang compliment, complicated? Why does anything get this complicated? Why isn't it a straight shot? All right, here we go. I bind the silo's head, the silo's feet, immediately signal something to go to the nucleus, and bam, All right? Why don't we do it just simple like that? I started off having a bad day. <laughs> okay. 
When I came in, my freezer and refrigerator were at room temperature in my lab. So, I need you to play today, okay? I can't be the only one talking, because I'm not happy with me <laughs> or anything else. So somebody think and just say something, even if it's wrong. Yes? I feel like if you just find it and you want to a reaction right away, then it's like it can lead to a wrong reaction, but you can put on a chain reaction, so you know like where each step is leading to. Just would it make sense? Then it's like what can you do it. if you have all these steps? You can stop that. Let's use a scientific word. Regulate. All right. We are we are all about regulation, and it's not it right. It's not as simple. Obviously, it's, I mean I'm like making it simple. I'm saying mighty ADA to IKK to NF kappa B. I already just took away all these extra molecules, so it's not as simple as I'm making it. All right. Notice there's a lot of yes. We can do this, but we can go here, or we can do this, or we can actually activate some other things. This is showing you TLR 7, 8, 9, and 3 in an endosome. All right, remember how I said this is a more up to date picture? So endosomes can signal, but they can also still use MIDI 88 signaling. There is some signaling that is MIDI 88 independent, meaning that it doesn't have to go through MIDI 88. It's way more complicated. And ultimately, look at all the different ways we can get things, all right? So it's not just NF kappa B. All of the things that you see here, AP1, ISRE, 7, 3, another AP1, right? Excuse me, these are all transcription factors. And it gets complicated because generally, you're going to activate more than one receptor at the same time. This is an individual cell. If you had to do this, if you had to think about this, right, and make this happen correctly, what are the chances of you making this happen correctly? Zero. Zero. Thank God, right, all day, every day, your cells can do this without you having to think. We'd all be dead. Very simple. All right. This machinery, and that's what it is. It's literally machinery that works together. When I bind Asilo's head, Asilo's feet know what to do without him having to think about it. Right? I bind, it causes my foot to stick out. My foot sticking out kicks Mighty 88. Mighty 88 changes conformation and now it can activate Iraq or whatever, but ultimately leading down to IKK. All right, it's complicated. So this is the uh, structure of all of the TLRs. Right? They have this tier domain, right? Total IL-1 receptor-like domain in their intracellular portion. And in their extracellular portion, they have something they call an LRR domain, which is a leucine-rich repeat. What, what's important about leucine? Anything? You know what kind of an amino acid it is? Not nonpolar. All right. Okay. So it has this repeat of 24 to 29 amino acids: XXL, XL, XX. Every time I read that, I think of you know like triple X. There's no triple X. It's sad, right? Uh, you don't have to memorize this, but all this is is a sequence of amino acids. How can sequences of amino acids play such an important role? What is their role? Proteins. What's that? The amino acids. Yeah, they make proteins, but what? it's not just the fact that they're in the protein. What is it that they do? <clears throat> they bind shit. That's all this is. I think you can boil down all of your cell biology to protein-protein interactions. Yes, we need DNA. DNA encodes for proteins. But once you're done, all right, what happens is really based on what proteins you have and how they interact with one another and what those interactions cause. Who was I, who was I talking to about affinity? Steven. 
I think I was, was I talking to you about affinity? And my affinity for you? <laughs> yeah? Right? And how, right, if we have a really tight affinity, right, we can interact in a very different way than if we have a very loose affinity for one another. Think of the things that could happen. Oh, you get it? Okay. That's what cell biology is. That's what immunology is. You're going to see it's just one signaling cascade after another. Okay. All right. So the TLRs are really good at inducing gene transcription. All sorts of different genes get turned on and turned off. All right, the next class of proteins are called nod proteins. Oh my god, right? Don't you want to, do you just want to, like, alphabet, blah, just take the alphabet, throw three letters together, and then you have a new protein. Nod stands for nucleotide oligomerization domain. Oh my god, what a stupid name. Nucleotide oligomerization. I don't even know that that has anything whatsoever to do with the function. They found that it did something with nucleotides, but in the context of what I'm going to talk to you about, it has nothing to do with that. Or not. So there's nod 1 and nod 2. So this was only 12 years ago, which is probably now another five or 10 years, because I don't update my slides. This could be, this could be an ancient slide. I don't know. Let's even say it's 20 years ago. It doesn't really matter. 20 years ago. This is new shit. All right. Scientifically, 20 years is like uh, nothing. Uh, each of these, all right. These, these are nods, nod one and two, and you can see that these are made up of domains. What is a domain? This is a really important thing for you to understand. Because as we go through, you're going to start understanding different domains do different things. So what is a domain in a protein? Uh, it, it has activity usually, some sort of activity. All right, and the way that I tried to explain this in one of my classes was if this is a, a string of amino acids, all right, yeah, and we could do it without, right? Here's a string of amino acids. This is going to fold, right? This is just the primary structure. Then you're going to get secondary structure, then you're going to get tertiary structure, and if there's more than one of these, right, we're going to do that with two different proteins or more, and you get quaternary structure, okay? Just pretend this is all already in tertiary structure, and now I do this. So now I have this loop here, and then I have another one. Let me do this. Okay. okay. So now here's a protein and it might fold up like this. Well, these different loops and like the things on the ends could have different functions. And literally what happens is a protein when it binds to something can open up, open up, and now a domain becomes visible and able to do an activity. That's all this is, is taking the structures, and it's like, you're, it's like building blocks. They're still linked together by primary, secondary, and tertiary structure. There's still primary, tertiary, secondary structure, but then there's also functionality within different pieces of those proteins. Okay? It's like a train. All right, you ever seen a train? They're all linked together. Well, the caboose has a function. I'm not really sure what the function is, all right? But then there's flatbed cars. And then there's cars that, I don't know, what's that? Freight cars. Yeah, okay, so flatbed cars could be carrying like cars on them, whereas freight have like boxes and shit in them. Different functions, even though it's still part of the same train. And all of these are domains that have functions. The most important one, what we're gonna talk about here, are these card domains. So card domains activate something called caspases. 
That's where the CA comes from. Cash base, I think recognition domain. I think that's what card stands for. What's an ACE? It's an enzyme that usually does what? A lot of enzymes cut things, okay? So these card domains allow us to activate caspases. And I'm going to show you this cascade of caspases. What are these other domains? Well, this is nucleotide binding site, leucine rich repeat, a pyrin domain, I can't remember. Beer, beer, beer. <sighs> this is on the tip of my tongue, so this was part of my dissertation. Can't remember. <laughs> Kill a lot of brain cells. Uh, I think this is an adenylyl cyclase domain. And then even had, right? We have some things we don't even know what they are. We know there's a domain, but we don't know what its function is. So when you start making proteins, right? These proteins don't look, these are not domains, these are non-proteins. They don't look all that different than NALPs, right? And you're gonna see NODs, NALPs, IPATH, and C2TA. These are all immunological molecules. Yes? Are those shapes just arbitrary? Yes, the shapes are arbitrary, okay? And so there's a whole chart that has like a hundred domains on it. You know, the shapes are just based on, okay, what shape can we come up with next? <laughs> the shape is just made up. So what are we talking about? We're talking about building proteins that have a lot of things that look similar. And why in God's name do we have all of these leucine rich repeats? Well, as we go through the summer, I want you to pay attention to all the different proteins that we have and the different domains and how can they function in the fact that there's so many different things that have to happen. I'm, I'm going to skip the talk. Okay. And let's talk about what do nods activate and how do, how do they work? All right, nods have two kind of sides to nods. One side is something called the inflammasome. Okay. Inflammasome. What word do you see in there that you know? Inflammation. So this side of the nods is about putting together this block of proteins, which can then activate downstream more inflammation. And the, the way it works is you have this nod protein that can bind to an adapter protein called, the adapter protein has a card domain in it. What did I say the card domain was? Caspase activation. And that leads to binding of pro-caspase 1. When you see a protein called a pro-anything, what does that mean? Pro means before. Before what? God bless you. Before it's activated. So it's like a protein that's not quite ready to go. It needs to have something happen to it for it to become active. There are proteins that are called pro-proteins, and then there are proteins that are called pre-pro-proteins. What's pre mean? Before. <laughs> so you can literally have proteins that have to get activated to get activated. Once again, all of this leads to additional, what's the word, regulation. In this case, the nod is going to activate it's going to bind to this card. This card activates the pro-caspase. It cleaves off the card domain. This card is now gone, and you have caspase 1. And caspases bind to a lot of other caspases. And in this case, it can lead to apoptosis of cells, which is what? Cell death. Or it can 
lead to secretion of interleukins, IL-1 and IL-18, and these are pro-inflammatory cytokines. Pro-inflammatory. Name an anti-inflammatory you know. That you take, what drug do you take? Anti-inflammatory. Ibuprofen is the one I was thinking of. Is aspirin actually, is it, it is? It's an NSAID, right? Motrin, okay. Those are anti-inflammatories, all right? They function to try to inhibit this entire process. This is what we're trying to, right? In your case, nods, I didn't tell you where nods are. All of the, all of the TLRs, they are bound to a surface. Either the surface of the cell or the inner surface of an endosome. Nods are found in the cytosol. So I like to think of this as your TLRs are really helping to protect you against things that are coming from the external, from outside the cell, whereas nods are protecting you from things that are inside the cell, in the cytoplasm. What pathogen can get into the cytoplasm? Viruses and some bacteria that can get out of phagosomes, all right? So nods are gonna be your protection in the cytosol. So they can either go down this way or they can go down this way. In this case, right, this was nod one, this is nod two, here's a nod. It has a different um, adapter protein. This adapter protein is called RIC. Okay. It's got a K in it, so immediately you want to think kinase. Whenever you see Ks, Ks in general mean there's a kinase. Okay. Notice what BRIC activates. IKK. Guess where that leads? NF kappa B going to the nucleus. There's a lot of repetition. Yes, it's irritating to remember the first one. Right? You're going to by tomorrow, you're going to remember TLR, MIDI88, IKK, IKB gets phosphorylated, releases the NF kappa B, goes to the nucleus. You're going to remember that. But you're going to see it over and over again. How does your cell know what to do? How does it know that it was TLR1 that got activated to do MIDI88 versus NOD, which went through RIC to activate NF kappa B? It doesn't. It, does ha it has no idea. It just sees NF kappa B in the nucleus. All right? So a lot of this is leading to the same function. And those functions, if this is a macrophage, to increase phagocytosis, to increase the respiratory burst, and to start making cytokines and ketones. Okay? <coughs> All right, here are caspases. You may think this is less fun than I do. I love caspases because it makes sense to me with respect to what I know happens at the end, right? Right, you look at that and you say, holy fuck, no way. Yeah, I'm with you on the no way, all right? So let's just go someplace where a lot of arrows are pointing. Caspase 3, 6, and 7. And okay, there's a lot of caspases on the way. Here's pro caspase 8 to caspase. Here's caspase 2. Here's caspase 10. Here's caspase 12. Holy fuck. Caspase 2, 8, 1. All right, lots of caspases. These caspases are part of a cascade of proteins that generally leads to apoptosis. Right. What I like about this is 
They even show you down here, they show you scissors. <laughs> That's okay. This makes me happy. It's going to, right? These cast bases are going to lead to the cleavage, which I love to say cleavage as many times as I can say. The cleavage, I can't help it. I, I'm stupid. My, my wife says I'm like a 12 year old boy. All right? Cleavage of lamin. What's a lamin? Where do you find lamins? Is lamin the same thing as laminin? No. Good one, Angel. Okay. Nobody knows where lamins are? I'm going to give you a hint. They're in there, too. Lamins. What creates the structure of the nucleus? Okay, lamins. That was an easy one, right? What is that structure? What are those? What's structure made of in cells? What'd you say? Lipid. Some is lipid, but, but not things that are... Lipids could... Think of lipid as like uh, butter. <laughs> it's, it's kind of mush, mushy. What actually... What makes a cell round? What'd you say? It's like a skeleton. All right, we're getting closer, so what are lamins? Oh. All right, do you remember any part of the cytoskeleton? There's three different kinds. There's microtubules, and what else? The actin and intermediate filaments. What's important, what's the difference between actin and microtubules on one hand and intermediate filaments on the other? Yes. They're stronger, why? No actin, okay. So these guys are polar and they have sides and they're made of, right? So actin is just a single strand, two single strands of globular actin wound around each other. Actin, right? G actins make filamentous actin. Microtubules, how many, how many strands are in a microtubule? <laughs> it's 13, all right, and they're alpha betas, that, right? Alpha beta, alpha beta, alpha beta. There's 13 of those and they make a structure that it looks like a pool noodle. Okay, you remember this? Is it coming back? And then intermediate filaments, how many individual strands? You're close. 32. 32. There's 32 individual strands, and those individual strands look the same on either end. They're made of tetramers that have Right? A tetramer has two, two, <laughs> two subunits that are parallel to one another, so the ends are the same, this is the N terminus, this is C terminus. And you take this and you put two more of them, but you flip them around. So now that tetramer has two N termini and two C termini on both ends. They look exactly the same. And then you pile those together like bricks, right? So and you have 32 individual strands. Okay, if you were thinking about the three little pigs, you wouldn't want your house made out of actin, right? Gone. <laughs> All right? Microtubules. Better, but not much. <laughs> okay, there's no blowing over an intermediate filament house. This is how, right, when, when a cell is dying, it's undergoing apoptosis, we have to get rid of the structure that's around the edge of the nucleus. They're not showing you all around the edge. The lamins have proteins bound to them, and what else binds to the lamins? The DNA, all right? So the activation of caspases cleave lamins, so we start to break down the nucleus. It cleaves this molecule, ICAD, 
ICAD is bound to CAD. Oh my God, right? This is going to be exactly, so once you cleave ICAD, it no longer is interested in CAD. It releases CAD to go into the nucleus. CAD cleaves DNA, causes fragmentation of DNA. And these are all hallmarks of apoptosis. So nods can activate this entire pathway, the caspase pathway. All right, so you're going to try to remember all these receptors, because basically that's what the quiz is tomorrow. Quiz, uh, evaluative experience, whatever we're calling it. <laughs> what? Yes. Or an evaluative experience, or you can, you can call it a, you know, a, I don't care what you call it master's thesis, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> you're going to come in and you're going to tell me what you know. All right, so we have phagocytic, we have chemocactic, we have right, TLRs and, and nods, which can induce gene transcription or induce death, depending on which nod. All right. Did you have another question, Brad? Yes. Yeah, that's what I was trying to, this is a way for you to organize your thinking. Uh, to me, if I just have to remember, okay, forget it, man. I'm like, I'm not good with long lists. At least this breaks it into shorter lists. Bless you. All right. We're going to, I don't know. It's been such a banner day. Let's just uh, call it quits here. <laughs>